Hi, everybody, and welcome back to A Catholic's Perspective, the podcast all about being a young Catholic surviving in a secular world. I wanted to come on here and do this podcast today. This is unlike any other topic we've really covered before. And because today, actually, when we're recording this, it's Infant Loss and Remembrance Day. I think this is a really important topic that needs to be discussed more openly. Um, And this topic is really important, I think, for the purpose of healing for those who have gone through a tragic loss of a child. But also this topic is really important for those who haven't experienced this type of experience, this type of loss, but maybe know somebody who has and they want to help support them properly. So in order to talk about this topic, I've brought on Nicole LeBlanc to discuss her own personal experience with this. So welcome. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it's great. I think, you know, we've been trying to do this podcast for a little while now when we first like connected over Twitter. And when I first heard about, um, you know, your babies, uh, Maria Therese and Rachel, uh, Rachel Claire, Mm -hmm. they are just so precious. And I first heard about this back about a year ago. Um, when you first announced, uh, you know, your little saints in heaven. And it just really intrigued me. And, you know, you have such a beautiful soul and like to talk about this and to open it up um, to other people to discuss. So, uh, yeah, no, would you like to kind of do a little intro for the listeners who might not know you all that well? Yeah, so my name is Nicole. Um, I've been married uh, since August 20th, 2021. And And Austin, Austin, my husband, is a convert, convert. and so that's that's awesome. awesome. Uh, Uh, We live in in Michigan, Michigan, the the Beach and Detroit area, area, doing traditional traditional Latin 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 Latin. mass. Uh, I have have Latina heritage, so I can speak both English and Spanish. And together we own a small business, which is an automotive car part. Uh, my dad passed away some years ago, so we just took that over and we're redoing what he did, starting from the ground up. And so we've been doing that for the past four years and it's it's been going really well. That's amazing. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you're, you said your husband's a convert. What did he convert from? He just believed in God and that was it. So it was pretty easy <laughs> to convert him. <laughs> it's just like, oh, same. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. More structure. <laughs> right. Yeah. He, he no, fell in love with Catholicism. So that was, at, at first he did it for me, but then it was, he truly learned about Catholicism and he's like, I can't imagine myself being anything else. No, that's beautiful. That's mm-hmm. how the best, that's how the best marriages kind of right. happen. You know, <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of graces that come from that. Mm-hmm. How did you guys meet? Uh, So we met, I was 19 and he was 20. We worked um, at a restaurant near our house and he, we lived like two minutes away from each other after we started dating. And, but we met at this restaurant and I was a waitress. He was a bus boy. And we just started talking little by little and started dating immediately after I started working there. So we've been inseparable, gosh, ever since September, 2018. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. So you guys yeah. just had your wedding anniversary a couple of months ago. Yeah. Last month. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really exciting. I feel like, especially when it comes to marriage, you know, there are so many graces that you receive through it and being able to have a rock with you when going through something that's really tragic, I feel like is so so helpful. Um, Mm -hmm. Did you kind of want to get into how that all kind of started? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, we knew from the very beginning, we wanted to be parents, we wanted to raise up a lot of children for a little army for God and Mm -hmm. um, have the church militant here on earth. So we at first, we still had a lot to learn about our faith together. I was always cradle Catholic. But Uh, we started going to the traditional Latin mass and that kind of just changed everything about how we saw our faith and took it more seriously. So at first we were kind of doing NFP just because our situation was kind of difficult. We were um, still living in my father-in-law's basement at the time. And so we just kind of looked at it from a perspective. It was still COVID time. So things were still shifting and like, what are we going to do? And um, so even despite that, we were like, I don't care if we need to bring a baby into a basement or wherever, you know, our Lord was born in a manger. So True. it's possible. So like, let's just put all of our financials aside and, um, we're just going to trust in God completely. So from January, uh, 2022, that's when we officially started trying to conceive and just let God be in control of everything. And it took us a while. It took us until um, October to finally get the first positive pregnancy test, October 
uh, 26, 2022. So it was like a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, it took us a while after like six months um, because we were both 22 at the time. So we're like, I can't believe it's been more than six months. Like, I don't know what's going on. And I know people struggle with, um, you know, infertility. So I know in the grand scheme of things, it's not really that long, but I didn't know any better. We went to doctor's appointments and like, yeah, and everything's fine. And just be patient. I'm like, all right, whatever. Uh, So yeah, until October. So 10 months were just, I was crying a lot and I was just so happy. Our prayers were finally, finally answered. Uh, But oh my gosh, it's coming on like a two year anniversary now pretty soon of that first positive pregnancy test. And yeah, I'll, I'll never forget it. We were just so happy and so excited. You start thinking about all the possibilities. This is a boy or a girl. We had chose names the very next day after we found out like, okay, this is a boy, it's this name. And if it's a girl, it's this name. And we were just so excited um, until I got really sick. I got um, the worst kind of uh, morning sickness you could possibly think of. Oh, no, <laughs> It was so rough. And um, I had told my mom, I was like, what if it's twins? Like, what if I have twins? She's like, no, stop. Like, don't talk like that. And um, she was actually going on a trip to Lourdes uh, during that time. So she was away from when I was six, seven weeks to eight weeks. She was gone during my very, very early pregnancy. So I remember she was FaceTiming me and she's at the grotto at Lourdes and I'm crying because St. Bernadette is my saint. And for some reason, I just felt so compelled. I was like, please help my baby, help my baby, save my baby. I don't know why I thought that usually like now I'm thinking, oh, praise you, Jesus, for this gift of life. But my first instinct was help. It was just Mm. a cry for help. So I knew from the very beginning that something was wrong. I just didn't know because I was never pregnant before. Something was really wrong. So we went to our seven-week confirmation ultrasound of the pregnancy. And it was at a Christian um, facility because that's what we had chosen. I would have done things so differently. Like I wanted to have home birth. I wanted to do all these things, no intervention, no medicine. That's what we decided what we're going to do. Right. And um we go in for that first seven week ultrasound and the lady that was, she was a doctor. She was doing the ultrasound and she was like, I have no idea what I'm looking at. We heard the heartbeat and we're like, I was crying, but she's like, I don't know. I'm only picking up one heartbeat, but I'm seeing two heads and I'm seeing four arms and four legs. And she's even asking my husband, he's like, do you see what I'm seeing? He's like, how does he know? How to read an ultrasound like a it's in like the yeah baby. totally like at seven weeks baby's like the size of gosh like a little peanut like not even so tiny so so tiny at seven weeks and we're looking and we clearly see there's like a couple arms four legs two heads but it was just one heartbeat mm-hmm. so she literally ran out of the room and got another provider she's like oh well if you maneuver the machine like this and like this it just looks like one baby So we just got that one picture and it looked like one baby, but she said this could be a high risk pregnancy because if there are twins, I'm only seeing one sac, one gestational Mm -hmm. sac. So that could be high risk if there's two babies in one sac. We're like, all right, whatever. At least baby's alive and there's a heartbeat and hearing the heartbeat at seven weeks is just, it changes you as a person. I was always pro-life, but if you weren't and you go in for your first ultrasound, that is life-changing. I mean, hearing your little baby's heartbeat, it's so, so tiny. So, so after that, it was just pretty routine. I was going through seven weeks until 10 weeks, super sick, super nauseous, going through it. And, um, 10 weeks came along and I was just hanging out and I felt really, really sick, abdominal pain. And I'm like, this is not normal. And I called triage and they said, take a Tylenol. And if it doesn't go away within a couple of hours, you know, come into the ER. So that's what I did. And it was already like 2 a.m. by that time. And I went to the ER and I just was in a lot of pain. And they're like, okay, we're going to do another ultrasound, make sure things are okay. So this time they had my husband not be with me during the ultrasound. So they did an abdominal ultrasound and another ultrasound to check on the baby. I thought I was losing the baby. I thought something was wrong, like really, really wrong. Right. So they did the ultrasound and she was just silent for 30, 40 minutes. She didn't even let me look at the screen at all. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is really bad. 
And she's like, okay, well, you know what? Um, hang tight. I'm going to run and grab your husband. So she runs. Literally, I've never seen a doctor sprint. Oh, my God. I'll just sound like she sprinted out of the room. And she comes back in like two seconds with my husband. And she's like, okay, well, I brought your husband in here because I want him to take some pictures. And I have something to tell you. And I was like, okay. She's like, you are pregnant with twins. And so she kind of pauses and I look at my husband. I'm like, I started crying. I'm like, I knew it. I knew this is what was going on. And she was like, but your twins are very special because they're conjoined and it looks like they're sharing one heart and other organs. Okay. And I was like, what? So this is 5 a.m. This is five o'clock in the morning. I'm receiving this news. And I look at my husband and he's still all happy and he didn't know what conjoined twins meant. Yeah. And for me, I have a little bit of a medical background. I was just crying and I just let it all. I was screaming like they literally wheeled me away back into my room in the ER. And I was just screaming. I was crying like, because I knew how could one heart beat for two people? How right. how could that be possible? And I just I, I knew instinctually as a mother that this is just not not possible. So after that, I had a lot of doctors come in. They admitted me to the hospital. No idea what the abdominal pain was about. No clue. Completely different. <laughs> they have no idea what it was. So it was unrelated. really unrelated. And just to get me into the ER at 10 weeks. So and to get this news. And so we were at a Christian hospital near our house. Uh, the doctors, I had so many rounds of doctors come up to me and were like, so, um, these are the statistics. This is what can happen. You have thoracopagus conjoined twins and they share one heart and they probably will share other organs. You will probably miscarry very soon and or um, this pregnancy could continue and they could be stillborn. Or if they do make it a little bit more to term, they could be born alive, but only live minutes, hours, mm. days sort of thing. But they were really adamant about you will probably have a miscarriage. Like that's probably what's going to happen. Or we can transfer you to another hospital to get an abortion done. Basically, And they, they never once said the word abortion, but they're like, we can transfer you to another hospital where you can have a procedure to have this taken care of is how they mess. so it. icky to have this yeah. taken care of as if they're not two living human beings, your right. babies, as if they're just some sort of uh, statistic. Right. It's it awful. was it was like a slap in the face to hear that. And so I, I genuinely like looked at my husband and we're like, what do we do? Like, we just got the worst news of our life. Our babies are going to die. And it's like, what do we do? Is what's like, we knew we we're pro-life, but my big thing was I don't want them to be in pain or suffering or anything like that. And they're like, no, they're, they're not suffering, but there's just, this is just their condition. This is how they're developing. And I'm like, all right. And after they came in and asked me over and over and over, I'm like, no, like our decision is no, I, I can see them on the ultrasound monitor jumping in unison. Mm -hmm. They're like happy. They're just vibing. They have no idea what's going on with them. Just chilling. They're just chilling. And so uh, after I said no to like three different doctors, there was a one doctor who was super adamant. Like she kept coming in and she's like, well, you know, if you don't have this taken care of, your life is also all on the line. I'm like, how? How could my life be at risk now too? She said it was, um, if you go ahead and you deliver these babies, it'll most likely be a C-section and there could be complications during that surgery where we could deliver both babies. but um, it's just one incision. So if we deliver both babies, there's a chance that your sides could rip open and you could bleed out on the table and pass away. So that stuck with me. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's terrifying. Yeah. Like that's really that worry. Cool. I'm like, what what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. I I she was super vague about it, but it scared me. That scared me. But I'm like, I still can't, you know, I'm not gonna to sit member my children. Like I'm not do gonna you, kill them. Do you think that was a way for her to kind of scare you into getting an abortion? Yeah. Do you think yeah? Do you oh, think that yeah. was like an actual possibility that you would have died on the table? Or no, no, looking at it now, I mean no. 
Yeah, that was ridiculous for her to say that. Oh my gosh. Sometimes they genuinely do scare you into things because, you know, they make more money off of surgeries than they right. do anything right. else. Yeah, no, but th so the whole pregnancy after that, I was um, I was scared the whole time but just because of that possibility. Like, man. So anyways, they did another in-depth ultrasound that next day and it was already December 12th. So it was Our Lady of Guadalupe. I got the official diagnosis for these girls um well we didn't know they were girls yet but uh so they shared a heart and they shared a liver they shared a diaphragm one set of bowels and one umbilical cord okay. so it was a lot of different organs that they shared but they had their own heads they had their own arms and legs uh so their connection was kind of like from here from the sternum okay clavicle all the way to like the lower abdomen. So okay. it's just like one big baby, <laughs> but yeah. they have their own extremities and everything. So <laughs> it was, love. oh yeah. So it, it was very interesting to see them develop. And there's like, this is definitely a high risk pregnancy. And if the pregnancy continues, we're going to have to transfer you. So I'm like transfer you to like a bigger hospital. Cause oh, we okay. cannot, we, this out, out of our hands, we do not have the technology for this or whatever. So I'm like, all right. So a few weeks later, I was transferred to a bigger hospital. I was transferred to the University of Michigan, which is a great hospital. I mean, my dad had his cancer treatments there and it was, I've always was seen there and um, I was, I, I was born there. So <laughs> it was like pretty full circle. I'm like, okay, like I, I know I'm in good hands. I, I do believe they do um, abortions there as well. That's where they were going to transfer me. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I knew that they were the top when it comes to like medicine, life-saving medicine. So uh, I was transferred and they said uh, the same thing to me. Uh, we can offer you an abortion. We're only going to ask you this once. I think I was about 16 weeks then. And I'm like, my answer is the same. I'm going to continue with the pregnancy. And from that time when I was transferred and got the diagnosis, every single day I woke up with that fear that these babies could miscarry. I woke up every single day like this could be it like i might see i might see blood i might see something this could be the end of what's going on so i was it was devastating it, it mentally affected me a lot and um i prayed a lot i said lord i'm your humble servant you can do with me whatever you want like these are your babies you can have them back you can do whatever as much as i wanted them so much you can have them back it's a powerful and prayer i i remember say it was just me and my husband in the room and i said that and he was tearing up at what i was saying and i said even my life too even if it's my life that you desire like take it you can have it i was not prepared for that but i'm like this is what i'm willing to do the lord and giveth and he taketh away blessed be the name of the lord so it was just that was kind of my motto the whole pregnancy and just you know he's in charge and i'm clearly not <laughs> so um yes yeah, so i was transferred and they offered me the abortion i said no and then they told me okay so this is what could happen we don't see your babies miscarrying there's no signs of miscarriage right now and i'm like oh my gosh like it was kind of like a little bit of joy yeah like, wow okay and they're like, we can actually see these babies going all the way until 35 weeks. They could be born alive. And we're like, oh my gosh, this is like the best news ever. But they're like, so it comes down to they're not going to live very long. That's not going to change. They cannot be separated. We can't give organs to one baby and one. No, like that's not that's not how that works. Yeah. And um, and then the C-section. We will most likely have to do a classical up and down C-section instead of the regular transverse bikini cut one and with the classical up and down one has its own risks for future pregnancies and mm -hmm. i'm like okay whatever like i'll just have to keep coming back to this hospital and whatever you you can deal with it but i was really scared for that classical c-section that was what i was most scared about with the classical you have to keep on having c-sections subsequently afterwards is that because if you conceive again there's potential to tear or yeah Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the, yeah, the biggest um, risk with having a classical C-section is placental abruption okay. if you try for a VBAC, I believe. So that's like the biggest thing. And all of my babies would have to be born a month early. 
and via oh. C-section. Oh, wow. So I was like, okay, there's a lot of information <laughs> here, a lot going on. These babies are going to determine future pregnancies. It's going to determine a lot, which is also why they pushed abortion because they're like, oh, think about your other pregnancies and all these other things. It's like, we live in a time of modern medicine. Okay. Like I'm not, I'm right. not having these babies in the woods. <laughs> like exactly. I'm, I'm here <laughs> in civilization, you know? So I have access to medicine and you can make these babies as comfortable as possible. And I asked them again, are they in any pain now that I, they, I see them growing and they're like, no, they're not in any pain at all. And I'm like, okay, that's great. Like, I'm just going to keep on being pregnant. And I was still super sick. I was really sick with the girls still. Um, a few times I had to go to the ER just for hydration, fluids, that sort of thing. And I think I had a lot of heart palpitations, but I think it was the anxiety that came with their diagnosis as well. At and this point, how far along are you at this point? So yeah, 17 weeks is okay. when I was transferred, I think like 16 or 17 weeks. Okay. And they had made a game plan. And typically what they told me, this doesn't happen in normal pregnancies. They took me into a conference room and sat me down and told me it was a meeting. It was a meeting about my pregnancy. And they're like, this doesn't happen in a regular pregnancy, but since it's high risk, we have to go over this. And I said, okay. And they wanted to have me have an ultrasound every two weeks to check mm -hmm. on the progression, to check on growth. And so I'm like, all right, that's great. Like, we'll just keep on seeing that. The anatomy scan came around 20 weeks. I was pregnant with them. And by this time we had found out that they were girls and stuff. And it was just really simple in the ultrasound room. Do you want to know? We're like, yeah, sure. And like, we're, they're girls. Aww. And we're like, we knew, we knew that they were girls. And it's just, the same way I knew that they were twins from the very beginning. I just knew. Mother's intuition. Mother's <laughs> intuition. It's always right. So um, we had selected different names for them already. And just because we have other names that were chosen for babies that will be here. And if these babies were going to die, we wanted special names for these mm -hmm. babies. So we chose them very carefully. And um, by this time, I think I put my story on Twitter. So that's when it really took off. And a lot of people had different questions for me and different assumptions. And did I yeah. get the COVID vax? Did I um, do this? I remember that. all of that. <laughs> I was like, guys, leave this poor woman alone. Like, geez. No. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm the type of woman to like scan like all my stuff at the grocery store to make sure there's no like additives and stuff. Like, Me too. I'm, I'm like that kind of, I don't know crunchy almond whatever you want to call no it seed oils no red dye <laughs> no no it's yeah. so not like that and um so that's just the kind of people my husband and I are you know we take care of ourselves he goes to the gym we do all these things and take care of our physical health um spiritual health that sort of thing and by this time I think a lot of catholic um news outlets in the Detroit area found out about my story and they got a hold of me and I think that's how it really started to blow up the Detroit Catholic in Spain, in Espanol, they're the first ones that contacted me. And then after that, it just, it blew up everywhere. I had interviews with like EWTN, National Catholic Register, um, live action. I had a, another talk with them. And this was all like while I was pregnant too. I was on EWTN News Nightly uh, with my husband. He's not <laughs> one to be in front of the camera. So he's just like, you can do it all. That's okay. Um, <laughs> But yeah, he was, he was a great support. I always would recommend to any young girls listening, you have to pick your spouse and pick the father of your children. Who's going to be that St. Joseph, that leader in your home? And, you know, you have to pray about that. And Austin was 100% like a St. Joseph to me, the whole pregnancy. Mm. It was it was wonderful to have his support and him being so level-headed and strong because this was these were his kids too. Right. So he was grieving just as much as I was, but he held firm and he was, yeah, head of the household. And yeah, I feel I like it's hard for the men too because they have this innate desire to protect and mm -hmm. to provide. And when that is taken away from them, not that they can't, but they cannot mm -hmm. do anything. Yeah. Um I think that takes a toll on men when they cannot do the one thing that they were created to do. Right. And after hearing that his kids will pass away and there's something going on with the wife now that I could pass away too, it was like so much for him to hear. It was overwhelming. And 
and we were still, you know, 23 now at this point. So we're like, we're yeah. way in over our heads. Like, I don't know what's going on. But again, just trusting in God the whole time because there was nothing else for us to do. And so, yeah, we, we just continued on. Uh, I celebrated my 24th birthday at the end of March, um, had routine ultrasounds and everything was fine, growing well. And so we had um, a fetal echocardiogram which was so cool. What is uh, that? So it's the echocardiograms are ultrasounds of the heart. And so fetal echocardiogram is just an ultrasound over my abdomen, but specifically looking at the baby's heart. And oh. the baby's heart is like the size, it's like this, like the size of a quarter or dime. It's just still so small, but you can see everything, all the details of the heart. So I don't get these pro choicers when they're like, it's not alive yet. It's not this, it's not that or whatever. And I'm like, I had a fetal echocardiogram. It showed that they had two left aortas. One mm -hmm. aorta gave rise to another. It was very strange, their heart and their connections, but it was pumping blood. It was working for them. And it was very strange. It was a very strange heart. And that's all that they could say. So they said from here on out, every time you come in for an ultrasound, we need to check for signs of heart failure. So because that will be the cause of their fetal demise is what they called it. So I'm like, all right. So every time I went in and they're like, nope, heart looks good. Everything looks good. And we're like, okay, thank God. This means we're going to prepare for a baptism and a confirmation and all these things. So that's what we did. And um, it wasn't until they, they gave us a delivery date of June 2nd. So I think that time it was the something it was a feast day of something i can't remember right now i have pregnancy brain i can't remember it's okay something June, it's, isn't that the feast of an imma the immaculate something heart right i think so i don't know i'll have to google wait yeah what year was it <laughs> so yeah they were born 2023 okay so those june you can keep talking and i'll google it <laughs> yeah so that's what it was and we're like oh great now we have this like extra extra you know thing to celebrate and um it's the feast of corpus christi really okay yeah so it, i knew it was something to do with the heart and which was super symbolic because two humans fused with one heart to me i thought mm -hmm. it was extremely symbolic and not to mention how rare these girls were and you can join twins are very very rare what a blessing so mm -hmm. it was it was beautiful them, you know? yeah even just it was a privilege for me to carry them as long as I did because I would there was no resources for me there was nothing for me to and just the people that I did reach out to had different conjoined babies with different organs different this or they were able to be separated because they didn't share a heart there's successful babies that were separated but they had shared like just the abdomen or something so right so yeah it was um it was a lot. I felt a lot by myself, just me and my husband, and we had no one else. There was, and every time I would look on Google, like, oh, conjoined twins at 18 weeks, it was just a bunch of aborted conjoined twins. And I would just start to cry. And it's like, why? Why? And immediately people hear conjoined. And yes, it most likely is a death sentence, but there's the other half that can be separated that are separate and live normal lives so yeah oh that that drives me crazy but um it was around may 12th it was a friday i believe and we went in for a regular routine ultrasound and the doctor it was a doctor who did our ultrasound she was like we need to move up the date for the c-section right away and we're like what and like their heart is starting to fail and um, their umbilical cord isn't working as well, providing the nutrients or whatnot. And the, the blood supply is, um, is starting to fail now. So we need to deliver them now on Tuesday. So we're like, okay. So we were not prepared at all. We're like, okay, we just got a, so it was a Friday and we heard the news. It was like four o'clock when we got discharged from the hospital and um, so everything was closed, everything that we needed to do, like contact the cemetery and the funeral home and like all these things. Um, so we had to wait until Monday. So that Sunday was Mother's Day. 
And it was so, I was so happy I was pregnant with the girls on Mother's Day. It was the only one I had with them. And so it was really, really special. And um, so yeah, Monday came around and that was the last Sunday. Like, so I went to church that Sunday thinking this could be the last time I go to mass ever. Like, I don't know. So I'm like just putting all my trust in God and receiving communion. Like if it were my last time, uh, I had went to confession on Monday and told father, you know, there's a chance that I could die. I don't really know how much of a chance, but it's always a possibility. And so I had a really good confession and I went to the funeral home and they walk in, I, I walk in and the director was like, how can we help you? I'm like, yeah, I need to plan a, a visitation for my babies. And he like looks at me in my belly and he's like, and what's going on? And I told him I have conjoined twins. And he's like, what's that? So a lot of people had no it's idea so crazy that people don't know what that is. Had no idea. Like adults. <laughs> he had no idea what I was talking about. And he's like, well, we've never had a, so he was like, so you don't need two caskets. And we're like, no, just, just one. And he was like, okay. And, um, we had also had our story reached, um, these two ladies on the West side of Michigan and they had volunteered to make a baptism gown for the girls, like custom made for them beautiful and i'd never met them before but they were so touched by my story and what i was going through they had made this because my aunt lives in grand rapids so she was able to bring us the gown and I, I cried when i saw it it was so beautiful and it fit them perfectly i don't know how they made it i have no <laughs> idea how because it was really complicated but it was custom made just for them and so we had this little outfit for them ready to go funeral home was done i called the cemetery that was all taken care of and everything was done. And I just had to get ready for the next day and had a really long talk with my husband. And we had a business like, okay, this is everything about the business this is what's going to happen. We had to put the business on hold for a couple of weeks or something. And it was, that's our only source of income. So right. it was a lot going through what we went through. And oh my gosh, I think I got phone calls even the same day that I delivered the girls, but I couldn't gosh, it was crazy. So the day came, it was May 16th and I went in at 11 to the hospital. They got me ready by one o'clock. The C-section started and they had done an ultrasound prior and they're like, we're going to have to do the classical C-section because of the way that they're positioned. And I'm like, oh crap. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> so, um, and we had a priest ready there. So father David Pelican, he was present in the OR and I said, I need my husband in the OR. They're like, okay, great. I'm like, I also have a photographer. Um, she's going to be there. They're like, okay. And I'm like, I need my mom. And they're like, okay, she can be in there too. So it was packed. The wow, OR was, was awesome. I let you guys do that though. That's amazing. It was wonderful. And, and even father had asked me um, when I had the confession the last time. And he's like, so do I need to be in the OR? And I'm like, yeah, father, they're not going to make it. Like, and, and they were born at 32 weeks, not 35 weeks, like we had hoped. Right. And I, I got a phone call from the hospital the day before saying, you need to be prepared. They will most likely live one hour. Just so, just so you're prepared. And I was just crying. I was just bawling because I'm like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this is going to happen. Like, this is happening very soon. And, um, yeah, that was – what else could I do? And so we um, – yeah, they were born at around 2 o'clock just because they had such a hard time trying to maneuver. I felt the tugging and the pulling. And I think they were born, like, with their legs first. And so it was just a lot of maneuvering. Okay, look at A's head and A's shoulder or B shoulder. And so I, it was really uncomfortable. I felt all the pressure, but – I wasn't in any pain and neither That's were the good. girls. So um, I was really nervous and I was really shaky. And they're like, we can give you something for anxiety, but you're probably not going to remember any of this. And I'm like, no, like, I don't care. I need to remember their lives. I don't want to miss out on their whole life. Right. And they were born and Maria Therese, uh, she was baby A. She let out a really big cry, which I was like, I asked, like, I said something to the doctor. I'm like, was that a baby? She's like, yes, it was. And I was not expecting at eight weeks early, at 32 weeks, being conjoined 
to even let out any sort of cry. She, right. it was really loud. <laughs> then it was, she was the there. Most, <laughs> she, she was like, I'm know. here. Her eyes were open the whole time and she was like fussy. And oh. I was just so excited uh, to see them. And Rachel Claire was born and she was just kind of chill the whole time. And her sister's like being crazy. And it was just so beautiful to see two different personalities of my babies and one just like me, one just like Austin <laughs> and they were identical, but they looked um, like a little bit different from each other too. So they could, I could see everything. It was just beautiful to, to see them. And they were immediately baptized. As soon as they were born, they put them right on my chest and father baptized Maria Therese and Rachel Claire um, in Latin and the confirmation in Latin as well. Beautiful. And, and so it was, um, it was perfect. I held them for a while until all the medicine caught up to me and I got really sick. So I'm like, Austin, you can hold them. My mom held them and I was sick for a while and, um, they kept checking their heart for, um, for a heartbeat and they're like, they're still here, but it's, it's starting to get a little bit quiet. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, okay. And, um, that was one of my biggest fears is, if I were to ask and they were to tell me they were to pass away, I don't know how I would react, especially being exposed on the table. I thought that's what was going to kill me, basically, right. was just hearing that my kids are dead. And so I, I had asked them like 45 minutes later after that. I'm like, is there a heartbeat? And she's like, no, sweetie, there's not. And I'm like, oh, OK, can I have them back now? And they're like, sure. I was, I guess it was just all the medicine and everything, but Austin held them as they took their last, last breath. And he just was holding them. And he's like, it's okay. You can go be with Jesus and Mary and Joseph now, and you can go. It's okay. We're going to be okay. And so he told me they let out, they breathed in together and then exhaled one last mm -hmm. time together in unison. And I'm like, oh, that's so beautiful. So they handed me back to them and I hadn't even noticed that I had my dead babies on me. I was just like, Oh babies. Like I was just like having them close to me and having that familiar weight. They were seven pounds, two ounces combined. So oh, they were, wow. they were big babies. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so it was, it was beautiful. They took me to the post op and I had my sisters there, my cousin and her husband, and they were just excited like, Oh babies. And I'm like, the only thing I could say was they're with Jesus now. And right. they just knelt beside my bed because they knew that they were in the presence of saints. They were yeah. perfect. And so they were like, this is the room where like heaven and earth are meeting together. They were just my, my youngest sister, she was 17 at the time. And she was like, this changed her life. Everyone in my family's lives for sure. And, um, it was just you know, wonderful to have the days with them. I was in the hospital and I was just holding them. They had a little cooling cot. So I'd put them on their little cooling cot and I would sleep. And during the day, I would just hold them. And leaving that hospital with just two boxes, two memorial boxes. And I had massive surgery. I had a class, the most difficult C-section to deliver. And it's, that's a lot. It was a lot. And I'm going to recover through this surgery. But what about my babies? What am I going to? I need my babies and it was there's nothing I could do except see them again in a couple of weeks for the visitation and I was crying again like a crazy lady leaving the hospital and all I had were these two boxes and there was another lady leaving the hospital she had all these baby balloons and she held her baby and uh, it was it was hard not to compare myself to others or feel pity for myself but it it took time to Right. What what were the days following like immediately after through the emotions and and it everything? It was it was a lot. I I remember as soon as I got back to my mom's, I think I took a shower or something. She helped me um and it it was really painful emotionally, physically. I remember crying the whole time as soon as I stepped foot in my mom's house, I was just crying. I we didn't have a home yet. Um so we're just I was just really, really emotional. I think they tried to put on a movie and I was just not there. I was just like looking out the window. Like there, I was not, it was hard like for the first couple of weeks. 
but one thing that I had decided to do was donate and pump my breast milk so oh, I could donate beautiful. to other babies as well. So that is what occupied me a lot of the time. And I felt really happy doing it. And I did that for six months. When you started healing and, and you know, being able to um, think about having kids again, were there any, t was there a barrier there? Was there any kind of uncertainty? How did you overcome that? Yeah. So I had that first follow-up appointment, what was it? Four, six weeks after the girls were born and we had already had the funeral and visitation for them. And they were, the doctor was like, okay, so since we had the classical C-section on you, you have to wait one to two years to start trying to conceive again. And I'm like, okay, that's fine because you had massive surgery and you're going to need to have another C-section. So I said, okay, that's fine. And this year I'm going to try to recover physically, recover mentally, emotionally, everything. I can't believe I was still alive and just, I was praising God for that, but I really was just living day to day. And once we got to like January time, we're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's going to be a year since their birthday. And then May came and we celebrated their first birthday in heaven. And it was so sweet. It was so beautiful, but I couldn't even sing happy birthday because I was just crying the whole time. <laughs> and um, I had, we were like, well, let's just, I, I asked the, the doctor because we had a preconception appointment. I told her, I really think that I'm healed well enough to start trying again. And she's like, okay, like, yeah, you're young enough. Your incision healed great. Everything looks good. I don't see why you, why not? And so we kind of prepared ourselves because uh, it took us 10 months to conceive the girls. I'm like, okay, so I'm probably thinking the same thing. And I like the statistics. It's harder to conceive. There's like a 20% chance that it's not, it's going to be pretty difficult to conceive after having a classical C-section. So I'm like, oh, wow. oh, we'll just leave it in God's hands and see what happens. So I had went to um, Belgium and France in from May, right after the girl's first birthday for my cousin's confirmation. He lives over in Belgium. So we were there with my sister and my grandparents for two to three weeks. And Austin was left behind here. We finally had our, we got our first home that, that winter. So we're like, thank God. And as soon as I came back from my trip, I had, um, I had a talk in Chicago at the Rockford Walk for Life. Yeah. And so that yeah. went really well. We're like, okay, like I have these, and over the, the months, of the girls passing. I had a lot of talks. People wanted me to share my testimony and mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm back, going back to Chicago in a couple of weeks actually for another talk. So I'm, I'm really there. excited. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, that's right. So I'm like, that's really awesome. I'm going to go back to Chicago mm -hmm. and just give my talks. And the following week I have a talk, um, November 8th in the seminary here in Detroit. So oh, sharing, yeah. sharing the same, um, testimony. And so I, got back from my trip, got back from Chicago, and I got pregnant at the same time. Like, oh my gosh, we were just so happy. We were in shock because we were not expecting it to be so fast. <laughs> and so I saw I was pregnant again. I'm like, no way. And then all the thoughts of the pregnancy kind of rushed my head, but I... I had been praying a lot. I'd done the St. Gianna Novena, like, and that was the only time, like, I'm really good about starting novenas. I'm really bad about finishing them. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like that's my motto when it comes to novenas, but that's the first one I like completed all the way through, like for sure, because I so had desperately wanted to start our earthly family. And so I saw that I was pregnant and I felt really positive. So that was a, a really good thing. I didn't, my mom kept asking me, how are you feeling? How, how are you feeling? How are you doing? I'm like, I'm doing good. Like everything seems to be going fine. Then the morning sickness came this time around and it was still pretty bad, but um, it wasn't as bad as with the girls, but still rough. And then I started to get to the point where it started going away earlier than when the girls, when I had it at like okay. 10, 11 weeks, it started going away, but I was still kind of sick, but I could start functioning a little bit more. And I got nervous because I'm like, oh no, something's wrong. And I couldn't feel movement yet. So I still am considered high risk this time around because of the prior C-section. Okay. Um, but I'm not 
monitored as closely just I think every four weeks is when they want me to come in for for ultrasound so we got that first seeing the our rainbow baby um for the first time and on the screen and we're like there's a heartbeat and everything looks good it's one baby and I was just so happy and um yeah we have our anatomy scan next week um I'm 18 weeks today yeah it's so exciting wow <laughs> yeah so you guys don't know if it's a boy or a girl yet then right not yet we're gonna the anatomy scan we'll find out next week I didn't want to be I, I wanted it to be a surprise my husband wants to be prepared so I'm like okay <laughs> you win whatever I'm just so like, like but don't it. tell me <laughs> well also because the last time with the girls I didn't get to have a gender reveal party I didn't get to True. have a baby shower I didn't have anything uh, to because I knew they weren't going to be here and I still celebrated the girls while they were here and afterwards and it was just I wanted to have this pregnancy a lot different this time mm -hmm. around and if I'm able to have a gender reveal party okay I guess another reason to celebrate and something I didn't get to do with the girls so we'll find out at the party which is just a couple of days after that's going to be so exciting. I'm so happy for you guys. Yeah. And I mean, what a blessing to have two saints in your family. I mean, oh my gosh, that is so incredible to think about. People don't usually think about that, but it's, it's so incredible to think about, you know, it is. And I have a really strong feeling I could be wrong, but I have a feeling this is a boy. So okay. I keep, I keep talking to him and I'm like, you know, you have your two saints, your sisters in heaven. They prayed so much for you because we asked, especially for their intercession of your older sisters for you to happen. And I'm like, imagine if you become a priest. I'm like, I know you can hear me right now. It's like, imagine yeah. you could be a priest and you can say you have two sisters that are saints in heaven. I mean, I feel like that's beautiful. I, I could die a happy camper as, as a mom. Like that's all you want is just to get your kids to heaven. And um, we're, I'm trying the best I can. I have a lot of flaws and a lot of things I still need to work on, but I'm just incredibly blessed that this is what God wanted from me, even if it meant giving him my children, like the biggest thing that he could really ask. I mean, he asked his own son to be to die for our sins and to give up his own life for us. So I was ready to do that for the girls. I'm ready to do it again if I have to, because that's just what a mother does. That's what you do for your children. And Every, every baby deserves a chance at life, it's especially those with the fetal abnormalities. That's like my biggest thing that I'm going through right now. Every child deserves to have a chance to find what happiness is to them, even if it's for an hour or even if they breathe one breath. It's like that to know that they were loved, to rest on their mother's chest, to just yeah. know that they were wanted and that they had they impacted lives. I mean, you said it changed your sister's life. I mean, how many conversions are going to happen because of your little girls, you know? I even someone on Twitter, they had commented, they're like, you know, I was, I was okay with abortions in the case where um, babies have a fetal abnormality. Um, but after hearing about your story, I am completely like 100% pro-life, no exceptions. So that I was just so happy hearing mm -hmm. that. And I, just a lot of other people, like moms, would tell me my kid has a really bad fever. I asked the intercession of your little saints to help, and their fever broke immediately. So even just hearing that, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. This is a, a big deal. This is a huge deal. And another story was um, this mom. She had gone in for an abortion. She took the chemical pills, and um, then this other mom it was a social worker something went up to her and was like you know look at this mom she had conjoined twins and she decided to have these kids and you know you could do the same i think her reason was she had like five kids already she couldn't financially afford it and so she shared my story with this mom who had already taken the abortion pills and she i think she took the reversal pill or something and she was just praying to god that her baby could be saved like she wasn't sure what would happen and the baby was born completely healthy and normal mm -hmm. after like she had repented and she had like this huge conversion after hearing our story. So I was just crying and crying and crying like, thank God, if, if I was able to save one baby, then what I went through was all worth it completely yes. 100%. 
And yet they're saving so much. I mean, they're working hard up there. <laughs> working so hard. We were just talking about that the other day. It's like, what are they doing up there? <laughs> they're working miracles. Because truly, like, you know, children's prayers are so powerful. And yeah. to be completely, you know, perfect and to go see the creator and be in the beatific vision. I mean, that is what we all dream of, you know, and for them to be able to experience that, you know, so young, it's just, it's beautiful. In, um, in your experience, while we kind of just wrap this up, it's a beautiful testimony I was tearing up to, um, what would you say helped you the most or how did people help you through those difficult moments? Was there anything specific you feel like you wish people knew or that you could talk to about people who know someone who might have gone through something? Yeah, I'm, just the sense of community, even the pro-life community. I, I told them I'm not going to have a baby shower, but there's a chance that they could live for a few days a week. And they had put together like a little Amazon registry with just a few things and then they sent it to me. So even that support was just incredible to me, complete strangers. Um, I was accepting donations on my company's page because we had no idea how long, if these girls did survive a few days, we had no idea how we could do the business and take care of these babies that have really complex problems with them. And I would be, need to be in the NICU, like I was prepared for all this. And random people had donated to help us because uh, the hospital's like an hour away. So going back and forth so often, every couple of weeks, it was a lot on us. And um, so just having that community that was there and especially seeing the pro-life community really at work and just people say that they prayed for me, gave me so much strength. People are doing rosaries, novenas, all these prayer chains. People had given me um, a, a spiritual bouquet. So even things like that, knowing that, I wasn't alone and I'm still not, you know, alone. People still reach out to me even today. And it's just so beautiful to that people remember that remember our kids and ask me how I'm doing. And I appreciate you and I remember you because <laughs> yeah. that means a lot to me. I think it's sometimes just the simple things, you know, some people are like, oh, well, what should I do? Like, should I, should I get them all these things? Should I, should I, and I'm, it's like, no, simplicity and knowing that you truly care is, is the best. Yeah. And especially having masses offer, like people offered masses for me and I'm like, that is like the best gift or even including me in one rosary. Like that's just, it's enough for, for me to go on and to continue after everything I went through. And yeah, I just, I thank God for my husband, my family being co close by and my whole family was completely supportive of everything I was doing and those that weren't. Um, I hope that my story touched their lives in some way and am able to see me now on the other side a year and a few months later that life goes on. I know the girls would want me to be happy and that there's still a lot of work for me to do, especially in the state of Michigan. There's a lot of pro-life work to be done here. Yeah. It's, I mean, I live in Illinois. I live in Chicago. Oh. We're in the same boat. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's rough. It's so rough. And pe people try to use, especially like my babies, the fetal abnormalities as an excuse for their atrocities. So I'm like, don't use my girls as an excuse. And I deal with a lot of negative comments even now. Oh, you've made your baby suffer and you did this and that. And I'm like, I did not tear them apart limb by limb in the in the womb. And they can feel pain at that point. And they were held in love their whole lives. And that's that's what everyone wants in their life is to be loved. Yeah. And it's so true. And you know, being able to share that experience with others, you know, like we said, it's it's gonna create conversions. It's going to make people realize the beauty of life. Like mm -hmm. the hardest stories are the ones that God turns into the most beautiful stories. Yeah. Really. Yeah. So, but I really do appreciate you coming on here, Nicole, and, and telling us about them because they're just beautiful. And, you know, Maria, Therese, and Rachel Claire pray for us. Yes, yes, they will. They most certainly, because I tell them to, so they will. <laughs> just like mom said. <laughs> There was, I, there was some quote, I forget by which it was a beatified someone, but he's like, 
your children are still obligated to listen to your prayers because you are their mom like forever. I'm like, I love that. I love that so much. So so I know that they're, they're listening. So accurate. They're just like, well, mom said, so we have to. And it's like, yep. right then. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I love it. Where can my listeners find you? Um, so I'm on Twitter X. Um, my username is Nicolita underscore D N I C O L I T A underscore D. And that's the same for Instagram as well. Um, I try to put like little informational videos about infant loss and ways to help moms. And I just talk about my life as just a normal 25 year old business owner dealing with my life, I guess. <laughs> No, I I totally know what you mean. I mean, it's a, it's a lot, but yeah, I think people will really, um, first of all, resonate with your story, whether they've experienced this or not, just knowing the beauty of it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think it's important to get the word out about, I know you've already been on EWTN and stuff, but there's so many people that still need to hear this story. So yeah. please keep doing talks and, and sharing about your girls because they are going to work miracles and they have I already. Will. Yeah. They're, they're the ones that are at work and they're just saying, you can share the story and I'm more than happy to do it. Oh, it's beautiful. And thank you so much again, um, Nicole, for coming on here and telling us about your story. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks again for having me. Absolutely. And with all that being said, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. You learned something. Remember to follow Nick LeBlanc on Twitter and Instagram, and I will talk to you guys in the next podcast. Bye. Mm-hmm.